A confusing thing for many people is that any amino acid whose R group is protonatable, so it can give or take protons, must by definition be able to give and take protons, meaning that it can act as both a general acid and a general base. When we talk about a general acid or a general base, this is not referring to what we typically classify as the basic or the acidic amino acids. Yes, those ones can participate, and you can have the basic ones be acting as acids and the acidic ones be acting as bases. But when we call something basic or acidic in the context of classifying amino acids, we do that because we're referring to how they act in their neutral form. So in their neutral form, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, they act as acids. They give up a proton, they become negatively charged, so we often see them in their negatively charged states, in which case they would actually be able to act as a base. In the case of our basic amino acids, well, that would be histidine, lysine, and arginine. We call them bases because in their neutral form, they act as a base, take a proton, and become positively charged. In this positively charged state, well, this is their conjugate acid form, and therefore they'd be able to act as an acid. But they're not the only ones that can act as acids and bases. And you, instead, you can have any amino acid that can give or take protons. So we're talking not only about our acidic and basic amino acids, but also the ones with hydroxyl groups, the ones with thiol groups, so our cysteine, our serine, our tyrosine. All of these are going to be able to serve as general acids and general bases. Because remember that the enzyme, in order to keep doing things over and over again, um, speeding up reactions over and over again without getting used up, well, that's the definition of what an enzyme does. In order to do that, it needs to be able to kind of reset. So if it gives a proton, it has to be able to take a proton in order to be able to give a proton again. Now, why would we actually want something to be giving and taking protons? This comes back to the idea of our acid and base catalysis. This is the one, one of the main catalytic strategies employed by enzymes. So enzymes are able to speed up reactions in a variety of different ways. This includes proximity catalysis, basically just holding things close together so they can find one another in the right orientation. It includes metal catalysis, which can also help hold things together because metals can act as these sort of general hubs because they can bind to a lot of things. The metals can also stabilize negative charges. They can give and take electrons, all sorts of cool stuff. And then we have covalent catalysis where the enzyme is forming a covalent bond with the substrate. So you'll see that some of the amino acids that can act as general acids and general bases can also act to do covalent catalysis because they can form temporary bonds with the substrate that can then get broken. But when we're talking about general acid, general base catalysis, we're specifically talking about just giving and taking protons. Why would we want to do this? Well, this is going to help us with nucleophilic reactions. If you need a review of nucleophiles and electrophiles, go check that out. But basically, a nucleophile is something that has more electrons or electron density than it wants. And so it's going to seek out something positive to share that electron density with. When we talk about where would you find positivity, well, positivity is located in protons, which are located in the nucleus. So a nucleophile is going to seek out the nucleus of something that has not as many electrons or electron density as it wants, something that's partly or fully positive, something that we call an electrophile. When the nucleophile attacks an electrophile, we can get a few different fates. We can get things like substitution, elimination, um, and deprotonation, which really when we talk about deprotonation, we're typically referring to, we typically call the nucleophile a base in that case. Um, but it is a form of this sort of nucleophilic attack. In order for a nucleophile to attack, to get any of these fates, we need to have that nucleophile be strong and our electrophile be strong. So basically we have to have, well, I mean, in order to have it happen well, we would want our nucleophile to be strong, our electrophile to be strong, and our leaving group to be happy on its own if we're doing a substitution reaction or we're going to be kicking something off. To make our nucleophile stronger, well, we can do this by kind of concentrating the negative charge, which one way to do this is by basically removing a proton. When you remove a proton, you leave behind its electron, and so now you have a negative charge, or if you were, um, if you were um, positively charged, you'd be neutral now. 
Either way, um, then you would be able to act as a nucleophile. This could also open up a pair of a lone pair of electrons that can go and attack. In terms of our electrophile, we would want concentrated positive charge. We would want atoms that don't really want to be positive to be positive and therefore be vulnerable to attack. When we talk about positive, we can be talking about partly positive as well as fully positive. In the case of our leaving group, we would want this to be something that's not just going to attack right back. So we would want this to be stabilized, perhaps by adding a proton here to stabilize any negative charge if our nucleophile is coming in negative. Let's look at how general acids and general bases can help with this. First off, let's clear up the terms general acid base and specific acid base. Typically, what we're talking about in enzymatic reactions is going to be general acid base catalysis. This is where basically one of the amino acids typically is going to be acting as the general acid or, and or base. Sometimes they're going to work through water. So they'll steal a proton or they'll give a proton to water in order to activate it. But the amino acid itself is going to be necessary to kind of kickstart the reaction. In the case of specific acid base catalysis, that specifically uses water ions as the acid or base and relies only on the pH. So it doesn't need anything to activate the water. The water is just the reaction just relying on the natural concentration of those hydronium um, antihydroxide ions in the water that are present at a given pH. As I mentioned, we're typically dealing with general acid base catalysis with enzymes. So let's dive in and talk about those. In terms of our general bases, well, what's a base do? A base in one definition is something that steals a proton. And so by stealing a proton, the base is able to strengthen the nucleophile. Remember how we talked about how a nucleophile was gonna be stronger if it had concentrated negative charge? That's going to make the nucleophile like less happy and more tacky. Well, if we take a proton, we can then generate that concentrated negative charge, and this is going to then allow us to have a stronger nucleophile that can then go and attack our electrophile. So in this case, we see that a histidine is deprotonating this water, which is then going on the attack. We call this specific, um, we call this a general base, not specific, because basically we need this amino acid here in order to activate the water, but it doesn't have to be a histidine any general base would work. Basically, we need something here that can take the proton from the water, but the water itself, there's not enough ions in the water in order to do this reaction without, without help. Once you have this, basically now you have that you're stabilizing the positive charge that would be building up in the transition state, and this is going to lower the activation barrier. Remember that that's how enzymes catalyze reactions is by lowering the activation barrier it takes to get to the hardest part in the reaction. It can't change whether or not the reaction um, is thermodynamically favorable. It can just kind of make it, make it faster. So if you imagine a rainbow with a pot of gold on one side, it makes the top of the rainbow shorter. But if the pot of gold was still high up on the other side, you'd be able to go back. You'd be catalyzed and the, it'd be easier to go back as well. Okay, so with our general basis, this is what we're gonna see is something like this. You can see that once an amino acid acts as a general base, well, now it's got a proton, it can act as a general acid. And in order to actually get reset, we need it to act as a general acid. We need to act it to act as an acid, give up that proton, and become reset. So in a minute, we'll look at a ping pong mechanism that's commonly used. We see it a lot with histidines, where we can kind of go back and forth between the acid and the base form. But it's not just histidines that can do this. And the pKa is going to be totally skewed in the active site. So we can see things like an aspartate um, playing a similar role. So we'll discuss that more in a minute, but first let's return to the idea of our general acids. Our general acids, well, these are going to donate protons. We wouldn't want to donate a proton to our nucleophile, that would weaken it, but we do want to donate a proton to our electrophile, that could strengthen it. So even if we have a weaker nucleophile, something like water, if we've protonated um, the electrophile, um, basically, what we're doing in this case, we're protonating this carbonyl group. This is going to make it so that the carbon, the oxygen is going to be hogging even more electrons from this carbon, making this carbonyl carbon even more partly positive, which is going to make it so that the water is going to want to attack, um, or it's going to make it more vulnerable to attack. 
And this is going to help catalyze the reaction. It can also help make for a better leaving group if you were to protonate what was be your leaving group. And it can stabilize the negative charge in the transition state, similarly to how we saw the general bases were stabilizing a positive charge. Both cases, you're lowering the activation barrier. Okay, so general acids and bases are awesome, and there's actually a lot of different amino acids that we can find them in. So again, we're not talking about just our acidic or just our basic amino acids. We're also talking about our things with the hydroxyl group. So we're talking about our tyrosine, our serine, our threonine. We're talking about our thiol group, our cysteine. And when we talk about the acidic or aspartate and glutamate or basic lysine, arginine, and histidine, remember that the acidic and that basic only refers to how they act in their neutral form but they're able to act as both general acids and general bases. Let me show you a couple examples of what I mean. First off, let's visit one of the biochemist's biggest enemies, RNAs A. RNAs A is an RNAs, it's an RNA endonuclease, and it's basically ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It's secreted by a bunch of different things in order to kind of protect um, from, from invading viruses, which, are often RNA viruses, and so you don't want to have their RNA attack you, so you go on the attack first, and you chew up their RNA. Unfortunately, in the lab, then, you have this RNAs A that's all around, and it can chew up the RNA that you're trying to study. It's also, like, incredibly hard to destroy. Autoclaving only destroys some, but not all of it. I have posts on that and things like that, but I'm not going to get into it. That's the part I don't like about RNAs A, but what I do like is it has this cool mechanism that helps us see what's going on. In the case of RNAs A, we kind of have a ping pong mechanism between two histidines. If we think back to histidine, this is one that we can kind of more easily see can go back and forth. It has a pKa around six. If we refer back to um, acids and bases, the pKa refers to the pH at which half of something is protonated and half of it is deprotonated. If you go to a higher pH, there's fewer protons around, less than half of it is going to be protonated. And if you go to a lower pH, there's more protons around, more than half of it is going to be protonated. As we'll see in a minute, in the context of an active site, all bets are off with this pKa. But for now, let's just say, okay, yeah, we can see histidine can go back and forth, no problem. So let's see how we can do this in the context of an active site. Well, RNAs A, its job is to cleave RNA. So it's going to break up this bond between this phosphodiester bond between these two RNA nucleotides. In order to do this, it's kind of going to activate the RNA to attack itself. Remember that RNA has that two prime OH, that OH that's missing or dehydroxy in our DNA. And so by taking the proton from that, now you're able to make this a stronger nucleophile that can then attack the phosphor phosphorus, breaking off this bond and leaving the cyclic product, which then it can break off. Note that because RNA has this 2 prime OH, it's vulnerable to this, but DNA with it doesn't have the OH here, it's not able to get activated in this way. When RNAs A takes the proton, we activate this nucleophile. Now this can attack. In order to make this part a better leaving group on its own, well, now it's going to take a proton from this other side, from the histidine on this side. And so over here, what we have is this histidine is acting as a general base. It's taking a proton. And this histidine is acting as a general acid. It's donating a proton. And now we have the case where basically the situation is flipped. This histidine over here now has a proton and can thus only act as a general acid, not a general base. And this one has um, doesn't have a proton, but it has a lone pair, so it can act as a general base, but not as a general acid. So what's going to happen now is the tables are going to turn, and this histidine is going to act as a general base, take a proton, and activate a water. The water is now going to be a strong nucleophile, which can then go attack, um, attack this phosphate, and then this can then go, this 2 prime OH can then go and it can take a proton back from this cystidine that's acting as a general acid. Now we have the situation reset and we can do this again and again and again and again. 
So again, we have this histidine acting as both a general acid and a general base, and we actually have two of them in the active site that are kind of swapping back and forth between their various roles. So as I mentioned, because histidine kind of has that neutralish pKa, we can it's easy for us to see that it can go back and forth. And in fact, in our bodies, we often see it, um, a lot of it in both of the forms, kind of just naturally based on the pH of the water. But it's not just enough to consider the pH of the water, we need to consider the pH of the active site. And this is a impor very important concept because, well, if we look at the what we call the acidic or what we call the basic amino acids, we see that their pKa's are going to be kind of, except for histidine, they're going to be wildly unphysiological. So aspartic acid and glutamic acid, they have these really low pKa's. That makes it so that typically the pH of our bodies are going to, or I hope the pH of our body is going to be way higher than that, and so they're going to be negatively charged. And in the case of lysine and arginine, they have such high pKa's that in our bodies, they're going to be typically positively charged. But that pKa is kind of just if it was a free-floating amino acid, and we don't have a free-floating amino acid in a in the context of an enzyme, we have these amino acids that are held in place in this active site that's kind of this protected location where there's a local context of the amino acids around it, as well as any substrates and things like this that are then going to alter the chemical properties of those amino acid side chains. So for example, let's take aspartate. If we look back at our chart, we see that aspartic acid has a pKa of around 3.7. So it would be very unlikely to just kind of um, be protonated on its own. But in the case of an aspartic protease, so a protease here, we're talking about cutting a peptide. So here we have an example of a peptide that we want to cut into. An aspartic protease is able to do this by using an aspartate as a general acid and general base. It actually has two aspartates in the active site, but unlike before where we're seeing a kind of ping pong mechanism, instead the one aspartate is going to be doing all the giving and taking, and the other aspartate is going to be altering the pKa of the first aspartate. What we need to do is basically we want to raise the pKa, we want to make it so that this is going to be, um, that this is going to protonate. Having this aspartate nearby, well, now we have this negative charge. We have two negative charges next to each other. It makes this one, they would like repel each other and this one would seek out more positivity. So it would actually be wanting to take a proton. You could take a proton from water, activating the water as a nucleophile that can go on the attack and attack this carbonyl carbon. So we have this aspartate that normally would not want to act as a base that is acting as a general base. It's taking a proton activating the nucleophile, which can go on the attack. Once you have this, you kind of get this tetrahedral intermediate, and now our goal is to split that intermediate in two. We also have the aspartate that's now protonated, and so now it's in the protonated state. It can't act as a general base, but it can act as a general acid. So that's what it's going to do. It's going to donate a proton to this nitrogen. This is going to make it so that this can then leave, um, and we get this whole system reset. So in this case, we have this aspartate that's acting as a general base, and then it's acting as a general acid. Now it's reset so that it can act as a general base again. And the reason why it can do this is because it's next to this other aspartate. So remember that the pKa of the side chains, or well, anything, is going to be extremely context dependent. Big picture. Acid-base catalysis is one of the key ways that enzymes can catalyze reactions. Anything, any amino acid that can give or take a proton can give and take a proton and thus can act as a general acid and a general base. This is not just our quote unquote acidic and basic amino acids and anything that acts as a general acid can also act as a general base. And so don't get confused by those terminology and know that anything, any of these, any, any, any of these can act as a general acid and a general base. So glutamate, aspartate, lysine, arginine, cysteine, histine, dean, serine, and tyrosine. You don't need to go and memorize these things. Instead, just know your amino acids. Look for the ones that have a hydroxyl group, your tyrosine, serine, threonine. Look for the ones that have a thiol group, your cysteine. The ones with the carboxylic acid are aspartate and glutamate and those with an amine group, lysine, arginine, and histidine. So knowing your amino acids can really help save the day once again.